Thank you for joining us on another season of Beyond Clean, a live podcast where the cleaning industry talks about everything that is healthy, positive, and proactive. Beyond Clean is a podcast that is broadcast out of our studios inside Gym Supply in Orlando, Florida. We're always looking for guests at Beyond Clean, so reach out to me, your host, David Thompson, at dthompson at academyofcleaning.com or call us at 888-999-6059. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Now, let's get started with today's guest on Beyond Clean. I'm Dave Thompson. I am the director of the Academy of Cleaning Excellence, and I am also the host of Beyond Clean with Ace, a podcast that we do uh, on a regular basis. So this afternoon's event's going to be a little bit different than what we normally do. Instead of our normal podcast only, we are doing this in a webinar fashion so that we can do this roundtable discussion. Now, when Dr. Greg gets here, uh, we're going to have the, the three of us gentlemen uh, talk about infection prevention and the, well, age of the pandemic. And there's Dr. Greg. Morning, all. Well, good afternoon. Uh, well, hey, you know what? <laughs> So now as Dr. Greg gets on, you've got all three of us. So, you know, rather than me, gentlemen, explain and talk about who I am and all that kind of stuff and who everybody is, I just thought we'd start this afternoon or this morning uh, by explaining uh, who we are, why we're here, and you know, maybe what we're passionate about and kind of get this roundtable discussion started. So since Dr. Greg is wide-eyed and bushy-tailed it is morning on tuesday in australia yep that's correct dave and daryl and listeners we're uh, at 6 a.m here in uh, downtown sydney we're all locked down due to covid <laughs> yes, half of the australian population is locked down it's just you know, it's unbelievable it's groundhog day <laughs> so uh, I, I have a, i have a background uh in uh microbiology and public health and uh, I run a manufacturing business uh, in uh, the downstream specialties area, primarily focused on, um, on uh, hygiene products, but particularly in healthcare, uh, where we are the largest manufacturer of sterilants in Australia. But we also uh, license material through patenting in uh, the US. Currently, that patent uh, license agreement is held by a company called Steris, um, who are a fairly large player in the business. And uh, we, we run research programs primarily looking at medical biofilms of interest, both on surfaces and medical devices, and more recently, wounds. So uh, we have a lot of background. We've got some seminal papers going back as far as 20 years ago, showing what bugs do on surfaces and how hard they are to clean away. And, uh, and of course, here we are in the pandemic with bugs and bad things happening. Over to you, Daryl. <laughs> Go ahead, Daryl. I'm Daryl Hicks. Uh, I've spent uh, about 34 years in hospitals leading the environmental services teams in hospitals from uh, 120 beds all the way up to 800 beds. Uh, so I've got, you know, all that experience of leading this, uh, you know, frontline defense uh, in preventing infections and that is with the EVS, uh, with better, more thorough uh, cleaning and disinfection. And so that's my passion. I retired from the workaday world of, uh, at the end of 2014 and just been doing what I'm passionate about. And that's uh, educating folks about the importance of uh, what we do and why uh, it's the why behind what we do. Uh, I think too often we dwell on the how to and use the purple stuff for this and the red stuff for this. And, you know, we, we don't give uh, those frontline workers the why of what they do. And it's not just about, uh, you know, mopping floors and cleaning toilets. And Dave and I have said that, you know, we're, you know, 2020 and even, you know, half of 2021, uh, it's time to stop messing around, just uh, mopping around and thinking that we're, we're doing cleaning. It's time to get serious about uh, cleaning. And while we kept our eye on COVID over the last 16 months, 17 months, uh, you know, other bugs of concern have gotten a foothold in hospitals because we had to have the EPA list in uh, products and 
Some of those uh, are not uh, sporocidal. And so C. diff and uh, real bug of concern right now is Candida auris, uh, which is a fungus. And, uh, you know, so there's a few disinfectants that have label claims for Candida auris, C. auris, but uh, they weren't being used during COVID because we were so concerned about having something on EPA's list in, uh, and that was the gold standard. And meanwhile, you know, things are growing in hospitals and healthcare. When you think about patients with these tubes going into them on uh, ventilators and uh, IV hookups and catheters and everything, uh, you know, some of them for a month at a time and in those ICUs. What we're finding out is that, you know, while the PPE was uh, in short supply and high demand, uh, healthcare workers were using, uh, you know, the same uh, isolation gowns going from patient to patient and uh, spreading things around because there was, wasn't enough to go around. And uh, so anyway, PPE, uh, you know, I don't know if that problem has been fixed, but, uh, I don't know how it is in Australia, but, you know, here I don't hear the concerns like we we were hearing and we've moved on beyond N95 mask and gotten the. Uh, what do you call those, Dave, the, the whole hood and uh, air supply what respirators? Is, well, full face, full face protection, full face protection. And uh, so N95s are a little bit. Uh, easier to find now, but uh, I think that is becoming the new gold standard for mask for uh, all ho hospital personnel. Uh, I so go ahead. I'm going to jump in here just a minute, Daryl, because I think audience this afternoon, we're getting up to close to 20 people. If you haven't figured this out already in the first seven minutes, <laughs> this is not going to be a webinar like what you've heard before. <laughs> now, Dr. Greg and Mr. Uh, Hicks here have been contributors on our podcast for quite some time over the years, have contributed material for our infection prevention series. Now, if you've just joined us, we have uh, four levels of the infection prevention series here at the Academy. So kind of the purpose of this afternoon is to go above and beyond just the standard everyday education that you get kind of trying to give you a look into what a master level infection preventionist should be so if you're here to find out you know uh, about what a disinfectant is that's covered in the technician the supervisor and the expert levels so if you want that kind of information please come to us we'll get you set up with all that the purpose of this afternoon or this morning, if you're on another coast other than here at the U.S., is to actually talk about some of the things behind the scenes. We have a pandemic that hasn't stopped. And if you thought it did, I'm sorry to tell you, uh, as Dr. Fauci finally agreed this weekend, uh, COVID is here to stay. It is never going to end. So right at the start here this morning, this afternoon, let's just kind of make sure everybody understands that. Now, more people have come in. We are going to be recording this so that you can share it uh, later on. Uh, we please ask you to stay with us. We'll probably sit here and talk as long as there's questions that are appropriate. So I'll be watching the chat, put in a question, but Dr. Greg, you had a podcast here last with me, and I think you brought up a few subjects that made Daryl kind of go, what? And question a little bit about what was said. And I'm not saying in a bad manner, just that he wanted some clarification. Sure, so sure. rather than him ask me, me try to interpret, I just thought it'd be best if the three of us got together and let's talk it over. Set Ready, set, go. Well, Greg, I, I have been a, uh, a messenger when it comes to disinfectants that if they're diluted uh, according to the manufacturer's uh, labeled instructions, 
Uh, many of these go through a dilution control system. And, uh, you know, so you brought up something that uh, really perked my ears up. And that was the fact that if the uh, dilution is less than the manufacturer's recommended parts per million, let's say it's uh, the label says in order for it to be a, an intermediate level disinfectant it needs to be 600 parts per million. If the dilution control system puts it out at less than 600 parts per million, say it's 400 parts per million, and you use that on a surface, you've done the research and found that uh, when you use something that is under diluted, uh, then you have these survivors on the surface and you take and you grow those with their kind of resistance to that disinfectant. And then you reseed the surface with those, uh, those stronger, uh, more disinfectant resistant organisms. You reseed the surface and then you try the 600 parts per million and the results aren't good, uh, even at the recommended parts per million. And then if you gather up those survivors and you grow them, then if you go up to 800 parts per million, there's still a lot of survivors. And oh, that yeah, is concerning to me because who is looking at their dilution control systems? You know, monitoring that you're getting what you should be getting out of that wall-mounted dilution control system back in the old days when we actually used measuring cups and we had a one ounce per gallon pump on top of the disinfectant. And, you know, we had people then, if one pump is good, four is better. And so they would, they would not follow those directions. So how important is it that we, we monitor that and that we control uh, what we're putting on these surfaces with the confidence that we're doing what we ought to be doing and that's leaving it safer than what we started with. Great question, Daryl. There's about 14 different concepts in there. So <laughs> I better unpack it a little bit at a time. So let me talk first about the bugs. So when I did microbiology as an undergraduate, which is a long time ago, Moses had just finished teaching at the school I was at. Um, he, um, you put the bugs in a test tube and you give them lots of warmth and food and make them happy. It's like sending them on a holiday to the Caribbean. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of breeding going on, but that's not what happens in real life. In real life, life is tough and microorganisms uh, work on a numbers game. The more that they produce the more likely the species are to survive. So they're constantly out there looking for survival. And um, so when it comes to disinfectants, you're not dealing usually with little numbers, you're dealing with lots. Right. And the concept, first concept you dealt with was um, sublethal concentration. That is the disinfectant isn't strong enough and you will get survivors. Now that's not new work. That's work that was done by Elizabeth, Isabel Mora, who was an English microbiologist in the 50s, the 1950s. And so she took a standard uh, uh, quat-type disinfectant, exposed a standard culture of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudomonas is very commonly found. It's the one that causes the sinks right. to get slime and gungy soaps. And it's also one of the superbugs. Right. And, uh, and it lives in sinks, so it'll cause outbreaks in things like uh, neonatal intensive care, uh, burns units, uh, anywhere where there's water splashed around and uncontrolled. So if you take that bug and you don't quite kill it and you keep going, after 14 weeks of doing that, it will tolerate up to 64 times the original concentration. Wow. So now that's a concept called inherent resistance. That is the bug's ability to resist. Now, it gets more complicated because modern research that we've done, and this is all published, has shown that, say, with chlorine, when you put the bugs not in a test tube like Isabel Mora did, but you put them on a surface and grow them up as a biofilm bug, so there's a genetic transformation that takes place, 
the expression of RNA massively increases. It's like plugging in the Smith family Robinson robot with the battery pack, you know, all the lights are working around the top and the arms are going and it's warning, warning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> For those listeners that are old enough to remember that lost in space, anyway, um, um, when you put them on the surface, they become incredibly resistant. So with Staph aureus, which we did, and this is published work, we showed that Staph aureus, once you grew it up in a biofilm and developed its inherent resistance in that way, which is what actually happens in hospitals, you can get survivors after exposing it to 20,000 parts per million of chlorine. So, you know, that, that's a really significant uh, impact. The same bug when we, we exposed it to heat and grew it up in that context, survived autoclaving at 134 degrees for three minutes. Wow. So as you're saying it, so as you're saying this, you know, I've seen this controversy, gentlemen, of heat. And, you know, when I think about the workplace, not the hospital, but the workplace, we see a lot of these hand dryers in environments where, I wonder about this heat. And then, you know, we also know that underneath these hand dryers, we don't get a lot of good sanitization. Um, oh, and, no, and, hand dryers and, are terrible. Yeah, I right. love them. <laughs> okay, so let's... They, so, they so, spray bugs around. I mean, there's there's really good evidence uh, that's been published in the last five right. years on, on hand dryers. I mean, if you want to take the bugs and spread them hither, thither, and yon... Um, Hand dryers will do it in a moment of seconds. You know, it's a boom, zzz, and off they go. So does and that increase? Does that does that increase their resistance, or or does that kill them? What what happens? No, it doesn't increase the resistance. But what it does, it spreads them to lots and lots of different surfaces that maybe aren't high touch surfaces, but they're surfaces that get touched occasionally, and uh, that you wouldn't expect those bugs to be on. Okay, so Daryl, you were you were talking about dilution control and not getting the dilution correct, and you were also talking about healthcare facilities. I think many of our listeners are probably also in schools because school is now in session here in the U.S. Um, so, are we worried about this same type of thing in our public environments outside of healthcare hospitals? Is this is this what we're talking about this afternoon? Yeah, because uh, I think that the flu season is still ahead of us. And, uh, you know, when you see how many cases of influenza were reported last year in the U.S., it was around 10,000. And so I believe that much of that that got reported as COVID uh, was influenza A and B and these uh, influenza strains, because normally, you know, what is it, Dave, over 60,000 that die and probably a million people that are hospitalized and 60 so, to 80. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, it's normally more than a million people in hospital during a flu season. Yeah. And a yeah, bad year could be yes. 5 million in so, the U.S. We'll have schools, you know, impacted by this flu season and, you know, masks. If people are thinking that that masks are going to uh, prevent the flu season from catching hold, that, that was the theory last year is that because we mask and social distance and uh, quarantine and all that, that that's why the numbers were lower last year. But I don't believe that uh, I don't believe what is being reported because, you know, common sense tells us that uh, that influenza is not gone away. And uh, so we're going to have that in schools. We're going to have it in uh, public health uh, situations as people open up, you know, not in Australia, <laughs> unfortunately, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Greg, as you were saying, though, if 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 the disinfectants that we are now uh, using much more than we ever have in society worldwide, not just in the U S but worldwide. Um, are we now needing to be more concerned with this dilution control and labeling? And, um, I mean, I've always been concerned about it, but you brought it up. Daryl picked it up. And, uh, I think it's interesting here this afternoon. This is our first topic of conversation. Uh, how should our listeners be responding to this kind of an issue? 
Oh, I think Daryl hit the nail on the head. You've got to check your dilution control system. Look, the first concept we got to was um, um, sublethal concentrations, uh, which is, in a risk sense, is what's called a false negative. You, you think you're killing all the bugs, but it's a right. false negative. You know, right. you, you think they're dead, but they're not. The other problem, of course, which Daryl went to, which was the old-fashioned problem, um, was one glug is good, two glug is better, and three glugs is best. <laughs> now, you're probably... You're probably going to uh, end up killing the bugs you intend to kill, but then you create other problems because then you end up more likely with residues, and it's the residues that the dis the, uh, the disinfectants that often the bugs will gain their resistance from. Now, I just want to make one quick point for for Daryl's uh, clarification as well. I talk about two types of resistance for these hospital acquired infections or healthcare associated infections. The first type is this inherent resistance that they can develop it almost innately. It's, it's an evolutionary process that they, they have the capacity to adapt. And I think, Dave, I said to you last week, the, um, the bacteria in the, the pools, the hot pools at Yellowstone, are a great example of that sort of inherent resistance and adaption. The second type of resistance we worry about is what's called acquired resistance. That is, the bugs talk to one another and they share messages via small pieces of genetic code called plasmids usually. And um, they, they eat the plasmid and it gets taken up into their RNA and then their DNA. And that tells them how to resist antibiotics. Now, there's a very big difference between antibiotic resistance and disinfectant resistance. Antibiotic resistance is acquired resistance. So those superbugs that have acquired resistance to antibiotics, they can still learn about disinfectants. They've still got the capacity for inherent resistance, but that genetic material is not swapped in the same way. Now that's, that's really important when it comes to disinfectants because you're not worried about the bugs permanently getting resistance to quats or glutaraldehyde or ferrocytic acid or any of the high level, really hard end disinfectant products but they still can get resistance. So, you know, practices like swapping your disinfectant regime on a regular basis um, yeah. still become really important. And Daryl also hit the nail on the head with Candida auris. I mean, in India, they're worried about a thing called mercomorcosis, morcomycosis, which is another, uh, it's, a, it's a fungal infection that's affecting COVID patients in India yeah. and killing uh, about a quarter of the COVID patients. So if the, if the COVID virus doesn't knock you off, the mercomycosis will knock you off. And it's a horrible uh, uh, infection that causes, if you like, black lung. It's awful. People so, Daryl, you and I have preached for uh, ever since we've known each other that cleaning is something that this discussion that we're having now uh, doesn't involve because cleaning, you don't develop a resistance to cleaning removal. So I, I, I'm going to go back to this. Are, is this where you're headed, Daryl? Again? Yeah. I was just waiting for Greg to catch a breath. But... <laughs> it's all good. I've got my bottle of water here. I'm all good. I don't know what's in the bottle, but... Uh... Yeah, my, yeah, my, yeah. I think mine's too empty for this conversation. At 6 a.m., it's just water, I can tell you. Just water. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a bit later, that might be a different deal, uh, but, you know. Uh, but well, this is but this is true, correct, gentlemen? This is what we're talking about. I think this absolutely. is what the industry has has started to wake up that disinfectant isn't the only thing, and and this is what we preached all year in all levels of our courses. That hasn't changed. I mean, everybody. The reason we did this this afternoon is because people all of a sudden are getting this. Oh, we got this Delta variant, and I what should I do now? And I need to go to do. It. But it, we're still talking about cleaning is still the, the thing. Yeah, Absolutely. because I think that is the the thing that that we're missing is for as Greg will attest to is that for too long we've we've depended on these toxins to kill the little boogers when we ought to be removing them, and if we do a better job of removing the soil, if we can get to ninety nine point nine percent with the right microfiber and the right neutral cleaner, then you know then there's not a whole lot left on that surface. But uh, as you know, all these disinfectants, well, many of them are tested in the presence of 5% blood serum. 
And uh, that's how they get their soil load uh, claim. Uh, but I think that we, we need to get rid of the term uh, clean when visibly soiled. Uh, we should be cleaning every surface because of this biofilm problem that Greg uh, uh, spoke about earlier is if we don't disrupt that biofilm on that surface and you can't do that with a spray and pray. You know, spray it and pray that, you know, your paper towel is going to uh, neutralize whatever is on that surface, because what we have is this biofilm that quickly repopulates that surface, you know, after the threat of the disinfectant is gone. And that's within minutes. And so very quickly it repopulates that surface. And so we need to be more about uh, removal of the soil from the surfaces and with the soil goes the bad guys, goes into a bucket or into a cloth that gets dropped into a bag and then gets laundered or, you know, if you use disposables. But, you know, I think that we we need to get over the notion that we just, you know, because, you know, when it comes to C. diff, we're talking about fecal matter the size of a pinhead that is infected has an infective dose to it that will pass on to the next person. So who is looking for pinhead sizes of fecal matter on a bed rail in a patient room? Oh, yeah. I don't know. My eyesight at this age isn't getting that, isn't that good anymore, gentlemen. We do no, have a couple of uh, thoughts here on the chat, uh, Dr. Greg. Uh, the last one said, Daryl, while you were talking, I completely agree with that statement. Thank you very much. Uh, but uh, Mike, and then um, I believe uh, Mike's in Toronto, Canada. Uh, he asked, uh, and this is while you were talking, Dr. Greg, should we not use PPM test strips to test solutions to help determine protocols for changing out solutions? That was his first question, please. So I think PPM means parts per million, <laughs> I assume. And, um, and look, I'm not sure of the test strips involved. Um, uh, in terms of of, of the normal approach at, at, at the higher levels of things, you, you're going to do things like validation. So you should know when your solutions are wearing out. Um, I, there's complexity so, in that question because I'm not sure of the strips. I'm so not what sure I, of the solution. Okay, so what sure I'm kind of thinking here is... Manually diluting it or whether he's doing it in a, a dilution system. It's a bit vague. If you can get strips and they are accurate, then absolutely you should use them because it gives you at least some some semi-quantitative way of assuring yourself that the disinfectant Quality is at the right control. potency. Yeah. Yep. But, and I think this is a good point because uh, Bill Fellows is also one of our contributors and we have a, a deal with him on uh, safety and handling chemicals and stuff. And one of the things that he talked about in his class and his podcast was the fact that we don't test our disinfectants and everybody is getting it from a dilution control, putting it on the shelf, putting it on the cart, and it might sit on that cart for two months. Does <laughs> anybody check that? And it's been sitting in a, a bottle that's been exposed to sunlight or it's been in, in, in a storage closet. And then they say, oh, well, I'm using a disinfectant going out here. So um, when our users, our end users are using these, uh, are we having problems here as well? Well, I know for a fact that inside of disinfectant bottles, and we're talking about like quat disinfectants, yeah. that biofilm will actually grow on the inside of that disinfectant bottle. And uh, so, you know, wherever the manufacturers of disinfectants recommend that, you know, you don't just top off bottles, that you, you know, you use it up, rinse it out, you know, triple rinse it, but even at that, I think that, uh, you know, you may not destroy the biofilms that are inside these, uh, you know, ready to use, or not ready to use, but, you know, like spray bottles or, yep. you know, the flip top bottles that we talk about, Dave, you know, the spray makers, you know, but anyway, I think that you know, quads are the only ones that, that I'm aware of that there are test strips readily available for, but I believe that uh, even uh, chlorine bleach uh, has some sort of a, a way to test the parts per million. But uh, well, what I'll say about <laughs> wherever you get to 
uh, you know, chlorine bleach and you, you look at the C. diff and, you know, you'll have the label tell you parts per million, but it's by organism, you know, on uh, a chlorine bleach label. And so if you want a C. diff claim, then you have to use a higher parts per million. It's close to, I think, a thousand, you know, 900 parts per million, where normally, you know, you would use it at 400 to 500. So, you know, I think this is where we get into dangerous territory of not knowing what is on that surface. So we have to go to the higher parts per million, but then we'll get into this corrosivity to the surfaces. And, you know, you, uh, Greg, you talked about the, the residue or the film that's left behind by these uh, things like bleach, chlorine bleach. But, you know, there is a problem, not just on, you know, a visual from a patient or a visitor's viewpoint of seeing these films on, on uh, stainless steel and what have you, but we have the, the, uh, the corrosivity of those disinfectants on these surfaces. And then, you know, within six months, you can uh, take an electron microscope and look at those surfaces and you can see all these pits and uh, how, uh, how that surface has changed. And we, we look at it as stainless steel and think that, you know, anything will clean or disinfect stainless steel, but very quickly these corrosive uh, chemistries are attacking surfaces and then setting it up for a, a more difficult chore of removing them once you have all this uh, pits and valleys that are uh, on those surfaces. Dr. Microsoft. Greg, did didn't you talk about all of that in one of our podcasts about that? Then oh, there's a great did. place for the biofilm to make home. I did, but let me unpack what Daryl said, because I just want to go back to one thing, which is the bottles. It's like the thought that someone's leaving a bottle of detergent or disinfectant around for months. What happens is whether it's a dilute detergent or a dilute disinfectant, the bugs work out how to live in it. And then they not only work out how to live in it, they start breeding. And so you pick that bottle up after a few months and your bottle is your mobile bacterial dispersing <laughs> station. You is, know. It, is it it's worse like, than the toilet it, they're trying to clean? Oh, well, the toilet's going to be cleaner than anything. You know, the toilet's <laughs> going to have the... I mean, people get used to the toilet bowl cleaning and they throw the bottle out, you know, so it's fine. I mean, you know, the toilet will be... You can eat your dinner on the toilet, you know, but the, the, the neutral detergent you've got and you've sprayed it around, say, you know, in the school's context on a school desk, you, you, you know, you've just dispersed bacteria and things like, uh, again, pseudomonas. So uh, one of the most common recalls for particularly antiseptic products um, is contamination with what we call commensal bacteria and uh, that, that are opportunists like pseudomonas, like a, a bug called Burkholderia. And they grow in these solutions. And once they work it out, they live happily. And of course, if you're unfortunate enough to be immunocompromised and you come across the solution, you'll get an infection. So, and so, let me say too, in terms of um, corrosivity about chlorine and other things, D Daryl's absolutely right. I mean, and you don't need a scanning electron microscope. You can do it with a standard light microscope these days. Um, the quality of uh, microscopy is so much better. And after a fairly short period of misuse, particularly, um, you will see significant damage to surfaces. Yep. And as Daryl said, that's what the bugs sort of go, yee-haw, here's a place to hide. Attached. We'll fill it up with our biofilm and we'll get re super resistant to these disinfectants. Okay, and so cleaning is the key. Yeah, and, and, and Mike did, and you guys brought this up, and, and the second part of his question was, okay, so we don't top off bottles, right? Well, then you guys addressed that. Thank you very much. Um but then we have somebody that's uh, saying, um, and I'm going to paraphrase here a little bit, they've got a meter dilution control system uh, from their supply chain. They place dry pull wipes and then charge the pull wipes. So I guess I think, you know, we're getting to a question of, so do I now get rid of bottles because I could have a biofilm in them and pull wipes are the way I should be doing everything? I think you're going to have the same problem if if you don't dispose of that tub whenever they're empty. Some of these, you know, you get a new roll of wipes and you put in there and snap on the top, pouring right. the disinfectant. 
shake it up, you're ready to shake and bake. And so, you know, in that instance, you know, where you don't clean the inside of that, you know, dis, you know, biofilms will grow and disinfect it. And, uh, you know, people think that that uh, chlorine bleach is, you know, so strong that nothing, chlorine bleach actually creates biofilms uh, inside of containers. So, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, the leading brand of, of uh, dis you know, bleach products in this country, uh, look at the, the papers on biofilm and they admit that, uh, that they will grow in, uh, inside of a bleach containers that Dr. Craig, how does the biofilm get started in a bottle? Yeah, I saw that question. Great question. So, well, first of all, look, the bacteria tend to be in the water. Um, even if you've got a good water supply, there are small numbers of bacteria that turn up and most of the time they're irrelevant. You, you can drink them, don't have any effect. But if you put them in the right context, so you're diluting your disinfectant, um, eventually they will form... Um, and, of course, biofilm itself is just what the bacteria build. So when they land on a surface, it's sort of like they want to form a home. They want to build a, a place for their family to live. And, they adapt and multiply. You know, that's their job. That's, absolutely. So they start making their own forest. And, of course, biofilms traditionally are things like slimes. So if you, mm -hmm. if you take the word biofilm and put slime in place, you know, eventually you'll get a slime, and that's a biofilm. Pond now, scum. Yeah. Pond scum's a, the, the, the tartar on your teeth. No, I mean, oh, gee, no, 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 don't go there. Okay, we, come on. The, 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 that's a biofilm on my teeth, right? Everybody has every biofilm on their teeth. Every every morning, every night. I thought Twice that was day, good. Change your I thought change that was good flora. Go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they're great. But if you don't clean them off, the bad ones will cause problems. And, so, and right. look... I, I suppose the point I'm making is biofilm is not a big, scary concept. It's that we now understand much better what bacteria normally do. And what they normally do is they grow in a particular way. And it's not like, as I said, we grow in a test tube. It's how they grow in real worlds. The other thing, too, I want to make a comment on, if I can, Dave, and for sure. Daryl's sake, is often when you, you do microscopy on a surface, so we go looking for biofilm, um, we, we, for example, uh, one of the seminal papers that was published by Professor Karen Vickery and the team at uh, Macquarie University, they actually went into a, a disused intensive care unit it had literally just been um, twice terminally disinfected before it was knocked down and rebuilt. And so before the, the, the builders and the demolishers went in, this is a microbiologist dream come true, by the way. <laughs> They went in with um, hacksaws and drill bits and, and a hammer and, and they collected samples from all over the place. The plexiglass doors, you know, you push the door as you go through. Um, they collected samples from the sterile medicines trolley, the soap dispenser pump handle, um, oh. curtain, cord, curtain cords, the blinds themselves, um, mattress covers, bed handrails. They got everything they could get. And they've been doing this work now for about a decade. And they've found, and they've expanded their work into multiple continents. It's, they've found that when they get samples back from ICUs, almost anywhere in the world, 90% of the time, there will be biofilm on the surface. And those biofilms will have multidrug resistant organisms inside them, superbugs. Exactly. Now, the reason for that is most people in an ICU are really unwell. And... And they're getting well, usually antibiotics. That's exactly right. Yeah. So they're getting antibiotics. And as soon as you've got antibiotics, you create what's called selective pressure. And there was a, picking up on a point that Daryl made, there was a great article published by Curtis Donsk, Dr. Curtis Donsky's group up in Cleveland. Yeah. At the PA hospital, where they looked at the flaws in C. diff patient rooms versus non-C. diff patient rooms. And of course, the C. diff patients are on very vigorous oral and uh, injection and parenteral antibiotics. So there's what's called selective pressure. And they looked at the patients themselves and the flaws, and they had a, a group of patients with C. diff and a group of patients without. Here's what they found. Even in the rooms where the patients didn't have C. diff, they still managed to find 
C. diff on occasions because the spores spread around the hospital. So that was the first learning. They go everywhere. And as Daryl indicated, very low uh, infective dose for C. diff. Two or three spores may be a sufficient volume to infect a vulnerable patient. Yep. But here's where it got really interesting. When they looked at the flaws inside the C. diff patient rooms, they were three times more likely to have VRE and twice as likely to have Staph aureus on the floors. And what they also found in this paper was that how the bacteria often get from the floor to the bed is people drop things. <laughs> they drop a blanket. They drop the nurse's call button. They drop the TV remote control. Oh, they drop gosh. A, pen. a nurse comes in to write on the on the uh, uh, you know nurse the, the medical chart, and they drop the bit of paper. And they lift these things up and put them back at the, the, the bed level. Now, of course, if it's the patient's pillow or a piece of clothing, you can understand the bugs have gone from the floor to the bed level. Now, that's, that's really quite terrifying at one level. And, of course, we know that we, we, we I think I've spoken to you, Dave, about a piece of work. I don't know if you've seen this, Daryl. It was done in Australia where they tracked VRE through an ICU. And uh, um, with modern genetics, you can do this. And they tracked it over a 14-week period. And um, what they found was in, the, in, in this particular ICU, they were doing routine patient swabs on every patient who came in. And then they were following them up with weekly swabs. And they were doing uh, swabs from the, the parts of your body that, you know, were in a polite company. So we won't talk about those bits. And uh, what they found was the index patients would come in and the bugs would move in the end onto inanimate objects, things like point of care devices, the uh, uh, wipe warmers, um, uh, IV poles, bed rails. But they could track the bug from the index patient via these surfaces and into the subsequent patients that were either colonised and or infected and then from those patients beyond. Hand hygiene failure, surface cleaning failure, and the bugs are forming biofilms and living in the biofilms. And cleaning is the key. Disinfecting is not the key. Cleaning well, I think, is the key. I, I, there you go. Thank you very much, because that leads to the question that's on the board right at the moment. And uh, uh, Gary's asking, so he wants to understand this, get this right. And I, I'm not sure which one of you are going to fight on over answering it first, because I know you both feel the same way. <laughs> Because he says, so what I'm getting here is I've got to clean first, then disinfect, dwell time, and and I could I could add my part to this, but I'll let you guys handle it. And then he says, do I need to clean again? Well, I'm gonna jump on this one, Greg, because it's something that Dave and I, you know, we really would over a a pint every now and then we would uh, have these discussions, but you know, why is it that we have one standard for hand, what we call hand hygiene, and that is uh, clean water, running water, and you know, one of the things in the Ebola outbreak in Africa back eight years ago, uh, they were washing their hands, but it was a bucket with a bar of soap with a you know string on it. And you wanted to be the first person to wash your hands in that bucket, not the last person. Yeah. Well, we have to have clean uh, water running. We have to uh, wet our hands, put the soap on, and then the friction for 20 seconds, and then rinse and dry it with a clean towel. Why is it that, that we have that definition for hand hygiene, but when it comes to surfaces, we spray and pray? And... Just you know, so we, you know, I believe that we need to follow the same protocols if we're going to call both hygiene, environmental surface hygiene and hand hygiene. Uh, we need to get to a clearer definition of what hygiene is. If it's good enough for hands that you're going to, you know, eat your food with and what have you, then, you know, uh, what I've I've said, and Dave and I agree, is that you need to do the uh, the cleaning, the friction, because uh, you know that's what disrupts the the biofilm and loosens the soil. And then you know you wipe that off, 
uh, rinse it, add your disinfectant, you know, because once you rinse it, you can wipe it dry, add your disinfectant and get dwell time of, you know, one minute to two minutes. And, uh, and then after it dries, air dries, then rinse it off because that chemistry, you know, you mentioned mattresses earlier, Greg, in that hospital where they went and cut up everything. Mattresses are a soft surface and uh, for these EPA registered disinfectants, it says for hard non-porous surfaces. So I maintain you cannot disinfect a mattress because uh, of this, uh, you know, the polyurethane backing, you know, pre is fluid resistant, but not fluid proof. If you ever cut open or just unzip a mattress cover and you see this discoloration of that sub uh, substrate, the foam inside there, you know that blood and urine and disinfectants have passed through one way. If they go through one way, they're going to come back out through the same way. So as soon as you lie down on that mattress, you don't know what you're exposing. The skin of an 85-year-old lady who came from the nursing home now is laying on these <clears throat> thin sheets that you can read a newspaper through on this mattress that never gets rinsed and never is really disinfected. So, Dr. Greg, I'm going to throw this back at you because, you know, uh, the Daryl and I've done many classes on this. And, and in, in matter of fact, on all levels of our infection prevention classes, we've talked about this. But, you know, one thing that I, I find very interesting with all of the COVID uh, issues that are going on worldwide is, like Daryl said, why is the disinfectant seem to be the thing and cleaning isn't what we talk about? It's all disinfectant, all chemistry. My point, and you're the chemist here, so my point and I've always uh, made this is all chemistry leaves a residue. And this is a great pace for the biofilms if we haven't cleaned. And part of the cleaning is the agitation to disrupt that biofilm. And if we never do it, that's one thing. But every time we clean, we agitate that biofilm so the disinfectant can work better. But my final thing that I always say is, just like my hands, just like my dishes that I eat, just like the car when I run through the car wash, I've got to rinse the chemistry as a last step. <laughs> oh, where do I start? Um, so let me let me let me start with answering one of the questions just quickly. Um, why do we have to keep cleaning the surfaces? Because we're all filthy. We're yeah. all like pig pen. <laughs> And the bugs live on us, and they keep falling off us. That's All right, reality. okay. So as soon as you touch the surface, it's dirty. Um, um, the other thing, just as an intro, that I want to just quickly mention, we're not going to have time to cover it today, Dave and Daryl, is measuring cleanliness. Yeah. It is yep. a super important issue. And uh, I literally, since we spoke, Dave, that uh, paper that I talked about has been published. I'll send it to you today. It's available on Gold Open Access. So your, listener, uh, your listeners and the... Um, and the same for you, Daryl. It'll all be open. It's about uh, a, a new Great. method for using ATP testing. But I want to go back to mattresses and biofilms because they're fantastic. And, um, and <clears throat> when we developed our biofilm model, you'll both love this, I had a hypothesis. I thought I've seen so many cleaners in hospitals. It's like, just kill me. Just kill me quickly. You know, make the car accident fatal, please. Um, and I thought, look, how are they getting resistance? Well, when you look at what a cleaner does, they get a, a rag, they use it on multiple surfaces, the soapy solution, you know, the, the mucked around bits and pieces. I thought <clears throat> all you need is a couple of days of this because the cleaners are doing such a, a, a an inefficient job so frequently of cleaning because nobody measures anything, you know. Um, it's all that the detergent's doing is giving them a wash and a drink. It's like redepositing food, giving them something to drink and, and rehydrating them and away they go. And they keep doing it and doing it and doing it. The biofilm just gets better and better and better. Now, in a mattress context, you don't even do that. And our research has proven that not only does the CDF, and we actually were not so much interested in CDF because, believe it or not, CDF kills less people than VRE. Yep. VRE kills more people. So we looked at getting the bugs to go down through the sheets onto the mattress. 
We got them to form a biofilm and we proved that they can come back up through the sheets. That data is published. So if you don't change your mattress cover and you don't clean your mattress covers and, and so forth, mattresses are like a, a, a bucket full of, of, of pseudomonas soup. Um, so so, well, so, so I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about the auditorium in the school mm-hmm. that I don't know when the last time that any of the upholstery in the auditorium was actually cleaned properly. I'm not sure I want to do that. I don't think I've got enough Petri dishes to actually grow all those bugs. That's but is it, but it, but is it this gentleman, what we're talking about? So well, I, when I you sit down, I mean, look, one of the things is just think about a standard hospital ground, Dave. So standard hospital ground, it's closed at the front and open at the back. What does that tell you about fecal oral bacteria? <laughs> I mean, really? I mean, how surprising is it? Have you seen that? Is it something's got to give the movie with Jack Nicholson where he's walking down the corridor holding the IV pole? You know, woo! You know, we make it easy for the bugs. We get really sick people and put them all in the same place. We, 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 we do things to their bodies that are dangerous. We cathedralise them and don't change catheters. We put in central lines and don't change the central lines sufficiently clearly. We give them lots of parental antibiotics, whether or not they need them, whether or not they're the right antibiotic for the right infection. And, and then we add in usually poor hand hygiene, um, so failure to observe the five moments, and top it off with cleaning where they, uh, and this is the other thing that is fantastic about bad cleaning is the cloth itself becomes the fomite. The bugs are picked up on the cloth and it's used on surface and surface and you take bugs from this surface and spread them to that surface. Now, normally in a biofilm, the biofilms are very discrete little bits. It's not like uniform across the surface. Right. The way you get it to get uniform across the surface is you get a cleaner to come along and clean badly. <laughs> and then they smear it <laughs> right to left and left. And if they're doing what they normally do, they're going in a circle. You know, it's like- yeah, but, yeah, and it's not the it's not the fault of the of the technician. The technician no. is mean well meaning. They're they, but it, it's Absolutely. I'm going I'm going to lay this squarely on the shoulders of management. Yep, this is management <laughs> not taking the time to understand, and that's why we're having this discussion this afternoon, right? Absolutely, because what we're we're talking about is we're talking from the inside of the bottle, the inside of the container that holds the 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 chemistry, whether it be cleaners, disinfectants, I don't care what it is, these bottles, these containers are not being cleaned before they're being refilled. People are topping them off. People are leaving them saturated with chemistry for so long that they become the agent of of, of destruction, actually, because they're just spreading it. And so I think this is what our, our listeners this afternoon should take away from so far, if I'm paraphrasing this correctly, clean the bottles, clean the containers, don't refill, measure the PP, uh, PPM of your product on a regular basis. Um, you know, so I, I guess this brings kind of a question in my mind. Why are we so caught up with the chemistry and how long it stays active when we should be changing it all the time. Well, I think that, you know, people, someone posted earlier, you know, that uh, last year when disinfectants were um, hard to get, you know, the supply chain was disrupted. Uh, Disinfectant manufacturers uh, tripled their productive, you know, production lines because of the demand because everyone started disinfecting stuff uh, that wasn't disinfected before. And so we, we had this high demand and people started using you know, wipes, you know, uh, whatever the, whatever you could get that had a, you know, and people look at the 99.9% on the label and think, you know, this is the, you know, this is what I need. But, you know, what we do with those wipes, kind of like Greg said, is that if we don't uh, define the area that that wipe will uh, effectively disinfect, then uh, what you wind up doing is using it on a much larger area. And, uh, you know, as he said, all you're doing is picking it up from here and putting it over there. And uh, so, 
that is one of my bugaboos, you know, early on when stores were reopening and, you know, they're at the self checkout and the, the kid with the spray bottle and the rag, you know, as soon as you got done with your kiosk, you'd run over there and spray it and wipe it. And please uh, take my book on area. Would you? <laughs> and people think, wow, they really care about my safety. And no, he's picking up uh, from this one and spreading it to the next one, to the next one. And so if we don't, and I don't blame the teenager that, you know, is being paid $10 an hour for doing that. I blame management for, you know, saying, you know, uses on one surface and then it goes in the trash, you know. So, you know, I think that we we need to be better about, uh, you know, the education, but also, you know, what we give people to use, you know, whether it's in a school or a church or an office, uh, a retail store, you know, we have to be smarter about what we give them. And then we have to educate them, not necessarily train them until they're educated about how things get spread around. And then Greg said, the, the last one is that we need to not only do observations to make sure that they're following the protocol as they were trained to do, but we're all actually measuring the results. And uh, ATP is one of those those methods. But I think that uh, what we've talked about, Dave, is how can you improve a process if you don't measure it? So we have to be better about measuring uh, cleanliness and uh, outcomes. And uh, and then, you know, because it's a it's a matter of either uh, products or process or people. Uh, those three things that uh, they enter into that cleaning and disinfection process. It's a three-legged stool and uh, the people part of it is educating and training them and then measuring the outcomes. Dr. Greg, on our last podcast, you mentioned uh, some new um, projects and stuff around ATP testing. Are we getting ready to see a whole new wave of protocols to to come out yeah probably later in the year i think dave we um we um i've published a whole pile of stuff on atp testing um, my doctorate area focused on it it's a fantastic tool but there's some problems and and it, it's an easy tool to use tool to use because you, you get your swab and you shove it in the machine and, and you get a number there are two problems that people don't realize the first problem is, well, a couple of problems, but the two big ones are, um, what does the number mean? Um, is it clean or is it not clean? And is there a hard cutoff threshold? Um, and the second problem is the machines themselves um, have a problem with what's called precision. Um, so if you've got, let's say you've got 100 light units of ATP measured by whatever the device is, and you get five swabs, uh, you'll find that you could get anywhere between a measurement of 90 and 120. So it's not very precise. You know, it bounces around. It's meant to measure exactly 100, and it's, it's doing this. Now, the cleaner you get, the more difficult that becomes. So I've worked on um, uh, an algorithm approach to it. You use more swabs, but you get fabulous data. And so we're working on turning that into an app. The uh, paper got published. It went up on the web last week or earlier this week in the, uh, the journal called Infection, Disease and Health. And um, But I'll, I'll send you a, a reference link to it, Dave and Daryl, so that you can download it. As I say, you use more swabs, but what you get is absolutely defensible data. What's more, in the algorithm that I've got, there's a cleaning intervention step. Because one of the problems with ATP is, particularly in the early days, people would get data and go, well, you know, I, I measured it and it was 100 before and I've measured it straight after the cleaning, it's now 400. It's like, how did that happen? Oh, well, we would know. That was because the cleaner's been passed and the, the cleaner's not removed, they've deposited. So, and the cleaning step is a way of uh, aseptic cleaning where you, you prove the surface could be clean which means it's a cleaning failure. So and no so one's I'm, been doing that. So, so what I'm hearing here, and I want to address a comment that <clears throat> can, uh, Constance uh, made here, uh, because uh, Constance is part of management, so we're talking right to her, uh, or I, I assume her, I'm sorry. 
Um, also, somebody likes your bugaboo, Daryl, just to let you know. Uh, yeah. Um, but I, I think this is it. Yes, we have a shortage of workers. Absolutely. There is a time constraint. And we talk about high touch. We talk about uh, contaminant surfaces and everything. And yes, we do have to be very critical of those places that we're going to concentrate things. But to, to just freely go out and spray disinfectants is, I think, what we're talking about is not the right thing. If, in fact, you only had time to do one thing, it's clean. And clean, probably. Well, and, and this is it. And, and to your point, Dr. Greg, we should be measuring cleanliness, not disinfecting. That's exactly right. As you so, said right at the outset, if you can remove 99.9% .9 by cleaning thoroughly, you've already done, you know, four logs of, of work. I know, you, yeah. you, the heavy lifting's already done. So, Dr. Greg, just before you leave that, because I think there's a lot of people, and I get into conversations all the time, of log reduction. So, please, you, you mentioned this four log, uh, and Daryl and I have talked about this, but you mentioned it. So, please, to, to the group, and uh, folks, I know we're at 5 o'clock here in the U.S., as I said, we'll go as long as the conversation is, and I can guarantee you with the three of us, it can go for a long time. Uh, but please explain log reduction in the real world, not just in a hospital. Sure. So log reduction is a, 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 a junk science term that's shorthand for instead of using a big number, you use a little number. So when you say one log, you're thinking 10 times, so therefore two logs is 100 times, and three logs is 1,000 times, and four logs is 10,000 times. The log, in the simplest way, is the number of zeros before the decimal point. So when you say you've removed four logs, it means you've removed 10,000 times the amount of bacteria that were there at the start, or 10, 10, and, and, and And the thing is, is in cleaning, we are not uh, biologists here. We're not <clears throat> microbiologists. We could be removing good bacteria as well as, as bad. Oh, sure. And I think this is the other thing that people are. Can you see like, the difference? Th you that's it. Difference? You can't tell. And 90% and, and <laughs> of what's there is good bacteria. It's not bad. It's what we have to have to live. Sure. Um, and so when you say remove that. Now, Daryl, I think you had a different way of explaining that uh, at one time. It was the amount of nines behind the decimal or nines yeah. with the decimal. <laughs> Same uh, thing. Same and, thing. Nines or zeros, it's the, they work either way. Right. So, but, so, so folks, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, and there's plenty of people that are saying, oh, we've got a disinfectant, we have a sanitizer. And so please explain to them, in order to be registered as a sanitizer, how many nines? 99.9? So yeah, I, I thought it was four, 99.99, but you might be right. I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the U.S. legal scenario, Dave. Well, Dave, I'll, so. I'll give you 99.99, but right on the label, it says 99.9 .9 as, right. uh, as a sanitizer. So, right. you know, I'm, I'm thinking that that's it. But, you know, what, you know, if you start off with a million on a surface and you reduce it by 99.9, .9, correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, but you would still have somewhere around a uh, hundred thousand on that. Oh, about, no, about, uh, it's about 10,000. <clears> so <throat> folks, what I'm, what I'm wanting you a, to a understand. A million, hundred thousand, 10,000. There you are. There's just okay. less than 10,000. So somewhere less than 10,000. So if you started with a million, you end up with less than 10,000. So I think this is this is a good point of, con of concern because whenever you start taking all of these things in, if you're saying that you've had an outbreak, and I, I'm just going to say this right today because the office at the RV uh, park where I stay is now closed down this week because there was an outbreak, and I got a call said the office is closed. We've had an outbreak. We've got special people coming in bringing special chemicals for special procedures. And I'm just like, oh, I wanted to hold my head and cry because <laughs> these are the same people that run around in a golf cart with a mop sticking up in the air going like this over their head in the golf cart. 
and, and I'm thinking, okay, so I wonder what the criteria was for these special people and special processes. So, you know, we've had a lot of talk over the last 18 months, and we will for time on about people having special jobs, special things, special stuff. Our message today was what, how do we keep surfaces safe in a pandemic? Well, cleaning is uh, job number one. And uh, EPA says that while cleaning does not kill any bugs, if you, if they're in the soil and you can remove 99.9%, then, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot left. And what we know about bacteria is they need three things to survive, food, moisture, and oxygen. And if you remove uh, much of their food source, then, you know, the idea that uh, only the bad ones are going to survive is not necessarily true. Uh, the whatever is left on that surface, the 10,000, you know, 90,000 or 9,000 of them could be good bacteria who overpowers, you know, takes the food source away from the bad ones. So cleaning is, is job number one and soil removal. And, uh, you know, that's not anything that you have to worry about with dwell times and what have you. But I, if you're not going to disinfect, then I highly recommend that you use a clean cloth and rinse that. And, you know, so if you use microfiber, to clean it with, you use another microfiber, uh, clean microfiber to rinse it, then uh, I think that you're, you're approaching, uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of removal. And then wherever you do have a disinfectant to add to that, it's got a much better job, uh, much better chance of doing its job because it's not fighting the soil on the surface. Yeah, let me, let me give you a, a maths illustration of exactly what Daryl said. So if you've got a million bacteria and they're in muck and goo and, and you get a cleaning solution and you remove 99% of them, <clears throat> so you've gone from a million down to 10,000 just by 99%. You've gone from a million to 100,000 to 10,000. So it's still 10,000, somewhere above 10,000 survivors. But then you come along with a disinfectant and you remove 99.9. That 10,000 number drops down to less than 10. So the advantage of cleaning then disinfecting is you removed a bunch of them. The big majority got removed if you've cleaned effectively. That was the first, you know, 900,000, if you will, gets removed. That's 90%. Then the next 90,000 gets removed. So there's 990,000 gone. Uh, and the 10,000 are left. Now you're going to disinfect. Well, the disinfectant doesn't have to kill 990,000. It only has to kill 10,000. So let me ask one question because <laughs> I've preached this forever, but I've never seen this. Has there been any studies of if I just go in there and spray a disinfectant, how much could it really kill? Oh, there's lots of lots of literature, literature about that, Dave. It's just it's in the scientific literature. And what happens with most companies is you don't want that sort of literature getting out there. You know, you don't, well, but this is, but, you but, don't but tend I'm to sorry. promote that sort of stuff. But I'm but sorry, look, this is what the lady's saying. We don't have the time to wipe all the surface, so oh, can we just go spray it? No, and you can't. And if you're spraying stuff everywhere, it will make things worse, not better. Um, and, and look, one of the problems with cleaning is, is I used to be very opposed to visual inspection, but actually we are visual people. I mean, that's oh, what we are as humans. And not, not only, only are we visual, we're tactile. We're, we have sense and smell. And, 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 and it's really, this is a very sexist statement, but women are really good at just walking into a room and going, God, this is dirty. They can smell it. They can see it. You know, it's not always the case. Some men can do that, but often the men are probably a bit lazy and not quite so locked in. Maybe it's part of nesting instinct. I don't know. But it's evolutionary. Uh, well, and, yeah, and the thing about it is if, it, I, the whole if, I, that notice, tactile if I notice experience it and say is something about it, then I'm the one that has to do it. So that's why I don't say it. <laughs> that's, that's just lazy. <laughs> Finally, you got to clean it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. So, Sorry, but... Uh... 
<laughs> you know, but but look, there's lots of literature around about disinfectant failure. And I mean, that was the whole point of Isabel Mora's work in the 1950s was saying, if you've got a sublethal exposure, get ready for the bugs to get resistance because they will learn, they will adapt. And, and I know um, that I know that you've got to go and I appreciate you getting up early in the morning and, and having a round table with us. We need to do this again, I'm sure, because once that this gets out about what we talked about, uh oh, I'm sure there's going to be a little bit of a stir. Um, but before you go, Dr. Greg, because Daryl and I can wrap up on our own here. Sure. Um, you you're in lockdown down there yep. for the second or third time. No. Oh. About the fourth. Melbourne, Melbourne's in lockdown for the seventh time, but Sydney's in lockdown for about the fourth time where we live. What's the so, future of our environment for the rest of this year going forward? What uh, do you see? Well, vaccination, we haven't had a chance and it's really outside the bandwidth, but you know, we're, we're busily vaccinating people and jabbing everyone's arms. Um, on, on all the mathematical modelling, once you get to about... 70% of the population having had the vaccines, whether that's a single vaccine or the two doses of the vaccine, you get to the point where um, you start to see tapering of uh, the seriousness of the infection. When you get to 80%, you see the infection rate massively drop. But at 70%, you certainly see uh, a significant drop in the, uh, the, uh, the, the severity of the illness and the morbidity that goes with it. And, and, of course, look, we haven't had time to talk about it, but the real issue with this virus is not just acute death. That's a bit of a problem. I mean, it, you know, that, that can be a real problem. But it's those that have long COVID, which can be, we really don't have hard numbers on that, but that could be as many as 10% of people who get a, really unwell. So as many as 10% of those that end up hospitalised end up with long COVID. Um, there's some papers starting to turn up on that. That's really significant because not only do they have a long-term health effect, but they then have continuing shedding of the virus. So we've been so c concentrated on one issue. Are we failing all the others? And as you said, 70%, and if we get 80%, my mind is telling me, you know what? If we would just do a better job cleaning 70% of the time and 80% of the time, maybe yeah. infection prevention would be a whole different story. Yeah. Well, look, on the other side of the infections with COVID, we're going to come back to superbugs. They're not going anywhere. And as Daryl started out to say, Canada Aurorus is now right to left, north to south across the US. I mean, it's endemic. Great biofilm former, by the way, Daryl. Candid Aurorus grows great biofilms. And, um, um, you know, oh, gee, that's, that's great cool. to know. <laughs> It's fantastic. What's more, those biofilms, you get bacteria as well as the fungus in them. They're, they're just super good. you know. So, so, so we're going to leave the folks with, hey, we got a new one going on. It is great. Well, you know, it, we've got to come back to cleaning. First principles. Mike Berry said, you know, cleaning is the, the process of removal of soil and microorganisms. I absolutely adhere to, to Mike's view. Um, and measuring it, I think, becomes, I think that's the next wave for us all is, how are we measuring cleanliness? I think that's really where the science is taking us and the practice is taking us. It's going to help management come to terms with asking for more resources. I mean, if you can't get your surfaces sufficiently clean, then you need more resource. I think, you know, it's one of the great ironies for the management people like uh, Constance is, you know, you need more workers, you need more resource, but how do you justify it? And, you know, someone says, just go and spray it. But if you've got a way of measuring cleanliness accurately, that changes the game very dynamically. Dr. Greg, thank you for your time this morning. Uh, we will definitely have to do this again. Gents and ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much. I hope you have a wonderful day and keep safe out there. Okay. We will. Thanks, Greg. Bye for now. Daryl, um, you know, it, it's been an interesting way to end a Monday. I noticed that we've uh, lost a few people. We still have a number of people on, so... Uh, folks, if you've been happy with what we've been doing, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I don't see any new questions coming up. Um, trying to keep a, an eye on that. Um, I, I, I just need to say this, but, uh, you know, when we 
we're talking about the pro not problems, but the issues surrounding disinfectants and their effectiveness and the power of cleaning. Uh, I think that one of the, the things that we sometimes overlook is, uh, you know, I just want to put a plug in here for, uh, you know, using steam to clean some of these, you know, hard to reach areas. You know, we, we used to have, you know, uh, a patient bed, like Greg was saying in the ICU and the patient was a car accident and bled all over the bed and, uh, you know, is down in all the cracks and crevices. And we always, you know, kept steam cleaning around because uh, if you can't reach it with cleaning and disinfection, then uh, steam is, is the next best issue or the next best product. And uh, it's the ultimate green cleaner and disinfectant. But, you know, I think that we, uh, uh, in my book, I talk about dry steam and even wet steam, you know, being able to, to destroy biofilm, you know, that we talked a lot about today that disinfectants uh, don't touch. And some of the, the cleaners that are out there uh, are doing better jobs of removing or killing biofilm. But, uh, you know, we need to, to have a full arsenal of, uh, of tools and weapons uh, in this fight. And uh, so anyway, that's... Uh, well, I, I think what you and I have always talked about and we instruct in all the classes, Daryl, is this is a process. It isn't cleaning by itself. It's not disinfecting by itself. It's not whether you use a microfiber or whether you use steam or what. It is all of it together. And I think so much of the time under our constraints that we have, and we all agree we have them, what management has to do is very, very accurately look at all of the issues and then go, okay, so here's where I am today. This is what I have. These are the resources I have today. What are the tools that I can use today? But always constantly be looking, and as Dr. Greg said, using the measurement of outcome of our process to validate where we are and where we need to be, because this is not going to go away. This is going to be something we're going to be living with from here on. One of the things that you and I have said, and I, I, I think we're still here, is one of the best things for the cleaning industry is to remember it is the cleaning industry and the pandemic has brought that to light. I agree. And it's sad that it took a pandemic for people to get interested in cleaning and disinfection the right ways. And, you know, as you said, you know, with your office there in the RV park is that, you know, a lot of people hung up a, shunk, a shingle this year and uh, went into the deep cleaning business because it was a gold mine and people, you know, were not trained, were not educated. And the consumer was just at the mercy of these people that, uh, that had the best price. And we're going to come in deep clean tonight. And uh, you don't know, want to know how they did it. <laughs> you well, know, they, you pay the bill and, and you assume that the deep cleaning happened. But, um, you know, I think that it's an opportunity to get truth in into the cleaning industry. And we need to be advocates for doing things the right way. Well, you know what, uh, Daryl, my wife, you know, we've talked about this many a time. My wife says, so what are you going to do? Go stake out the office and see who, what they take in and everything. I said, Oh, you know me so well, dear. You know me so well. Um, You'll have your camera phone out too. I, 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 you know, I, I hate to, I hate to say that, but yes, I, I'm going to be watching because, I mean, folks, this is what we're talking about this afternoon. We thank every one of you who have been with us. Yes. We will be putting this out on our podcast, what is Podbean. Uh, we usually do them live, but today we did it live here, and we're going to put this out on YouTube. So. Folks, if you're in management, you've enjoyed this today, please spread the word. Please make sure that they get the links to all of this information. If you would like to be on one of our podcasts or on one of our YouTubes like this, please get hold of me. My information is dthompson at academyofcleaning.com. Or you can text me on my phone number. And yes, I'll give it out here right now. 321-205-6448. 
I'm here to help you. We, we have three words, three words, <laughs> healthy, positive, and proactive. And hopefully this afternoon, we touched on all of those. Daryl, thank you for your time again this afternoon. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for all of you that have stayed on. And, you know, if there's questions that we didn't get answered, Dave's going to uh, put those in buckets. And between Greg and I and Dave, we'll, we'll get back to you if your question wasn't answered. Well, I think we did answer most of them. There was a few comments, but uh, like uh, Daryl said, get that to me. Daryl, if they want to get hold of you, how do they do it? It's my email is Daryl, D-A-R-R-E-L, at DarylHicks.com. That's D-A-R-R-E-L-H-I-C-K-S.com. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Hopefully, it's been uh, what you expected. Maybe or maybe not. I'm not sure. Uh, but it's been a good discussion. Daryl, uh, we're going to have to try these three-way roundtables again. I think that was fun. Okay. Have a good Thanks. evening. Bye, all. Bye, everyone.